The IBDGC Africa section is a newly launched independent branch of the IBDGC, which has over 70 African affiliated neurologists and neuroscientists in 11 African countries. And the main mission of the IBDGC Africa Consortium is to improve understanding of Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions in Africa through clinical and genetic research. In addition to that, this new initiative is dedicated to support training and capacity building related to Parkinson's disease and other neurodegenerative conditions. As I mentioned, our uh, today's guest is Professor John Hardy, and I'm quite sure that he doesn't need an intro. He does, he does not need an introduction, but let me quickly introduce him. Uh, Professor John Hardy is the chair of molecular biology of neurological disease at the UCL Institute of Neurology and also a group leader at the UK Dementia Research, Research Institute at UCL. He is a world leading neurogeneticist in the field of neurodegenerative disorders, receiving numerous awards that include the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the Brain Prize, and in 2009 being elected a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, in 1991, Hardy's team uncovered the first mutation directly implicated in Alzheimer's disease leading to the formulation of the highly influential amyloid, ca amyloid cascade hypothesis. Uh, before we get started, I just would like to remind our audience that this webinar is designed to be interactive and they can ask as many questions as they want by simply typing their, qu their questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen and Prof. Hardy will reply at the end. Uh, Professor Hardy, again, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Now I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much and thanks for the honor of having me. Uh, and thanks for the honor of having me on this uh, series in this strange time. I'm broadcasting from my mother's house so this is an unusual place to be doing this lecture from. I hope my mum doesn't come in while we're lecturing but um, anyway it's very nice of you to do this uh, for me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about uh, the, well, I'll give you my brief, my brief research history, and then I'll talk about uh, the progress we've made in Parkinson's disease in Caucasian populations, in European populations, finding firstly both dominant and recessive genes, and then uh, through the leadership really of the IPDGC, finding uh, GWAS hits, that's hits, uh, across the genome which have small influences on risk of disease. And then at the end, I'll talk about why it's really important we now, we now also study the genetics of Parkinson's disease in African populations. So I'm now going to share my screen. It'll just be a bit fiddly for a second while I do that. So this yep. is the title of my talk, and uh, I'll just move you to one side, and there we go. Uh, and uh, I'll just talk about where, we're, where we are uh, up to. So I started, I, when I was a student, I always wanted to study neurological diseases. And um, so I started by doing neurochemistry and neuropathology as a, uh, as a P well, actually as an undergraduate and then as a PhD student. So I started by looking at the changes in the brains of people who died of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So I, I started by studying those diseases. Of course, in Alzheimer's disease, that type of approach had ident led to the uh, identification of the cholinergic deficit in Alzheimer's disease and then indirectly uh, to cholinergic therapies for Alzheimer's, uh, for Alzheimer's disease. And this obviously was very influential. But what I realized uh, was that as we were studying the neurochemistry of the disease, of course we were studying post-mortem brain tissue. So what we were doing is studying the end stage of the disease. We were studying the end of the disease. And uh, as we started, I thought that would be all that we could do. But then in 1983, this extremely influential paper came out from Jim Gusella's group in Boston, 
using the newly developed technologies of well DNA, of DNA uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism uh, analysis in pedigrees with disease. And this paper excited me as a postdoc, and I'm sure it excited a generation of scientists the same age as me, the, the, you know, a whole cohort of individuals. Because what I realized looking at this paper was that this is a way to find out how the disease, how diseases, how genetic diseases start. We obviously had got through pathology and neurochemistry and a good idea of how they ended, but this I thought would give us a good idea as how they, of how they started. And by putting these two things together, how a disease starts and how it ends, we should be able, hopefully, to draw a line between the two, a metabolic line between the start and the finish, and then understanding that biochemical pathway, we might be able to prevent the disease. So when this paper came out, it had a huge influence on me, and I was very fortunate to be able to join a department who were applying molecular genetics. In fact, they were studying, the department I was studying was studying mainly cystic fibrosis, uh, and to try and understand the, the genetics of the disease. I have to say that when this paper came out, we thought it would be rather easy to find the genes from this paper. But in fact, in, in this study of Huntington's disease, it took 10 years to go from knowing where the gene was on the chromosome to finding the gene. That was because the, the human genome had not been sequenced uh, and we didn't have markers across the genome uh, and so on. And so PCR hadn't been invented and, and certainly DNA chips had not been invented. And so the techniques we were using were much more labor intensive then. Nowadays, to go from linkage to gene in a good family with disease is probably three, three months to six months uh, work in a, good, in a well set up lab. So the promise of genetics in 1983 was that we could do this the real, the, the, real, the realistic truth was that this only became easy to do, easy to do, I would say, from about 2010 to 2015. Now, the first kindred I worked on in Parkinson's disease, I worked on this with uh, Andy Singleton, uh, and this kindred uh, had been collected at the Mayo Clinic where I worked at the time. And this, the, this part of the kindred here, this part of the kindred here, who I got to know in the 1990s, had been coming to the Mayo Clinic for their clinical care since this person came in about 1920. So you can see four generations of individuals had come uh, to the Mayo Clinic and many of the blood samples, the blood samples of all these individuals have been taken at the Mayo Clinic. But remarkably, this individual here, who my arrow is on, was still alive then. And he'd seen his two siblings die of the disease in their 40s, but he was by now 80. And he had carried out genealogy and realized this, this other family, which had moved to California, was part of the same family and the joining up of the two families allowed us to draw this large pedigree in which we could identify the underlying mutation. Now, Bob Nussbaum at, at well, then at NIH, now at UCSF, had identified the synuclein gene a few years before, uh, and we collected this family and did linkage analysis. So we looked to see which areas of the genome all the uh, affected individuals shared, and we found they shared the synuclein locus. And when we did analysis, we saw something very surprising at the time. And you can see it most clearly on this chromosome spread here. 
Here is a cro the normal chromosome 4, and it's labeled, here is the synuclein locus here on chromosome 4. You can see there's one copy of the synuclein gene, but here on the other chromosome 4, the chromosome 4, which has been effect, uh, 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 inherited from the affected parent, there are in fact three copies of the chromosome, uh, of the gene. So in fact, this person who has got early onset Parkinson's disease, and I'll show you a video of this uh, person in a minute, this person has got four copies of the synuclein gene instead of the two copies the rest of us have got. And that has a simple consequence, and that is these people make twice, people with this mutation, make twice as much synuclein as their unaffected brothers and sisters. Now, when you look at the pathology of Parkinson's disease, and this is um, taken by Tamara and Lashley at Queen Square, and you can see this is lit up with the synuclein antibody. And what you can see is that Lewy bodies, the pathology of synuclein, uh, light up uh, Lewy bodies. So what we're seeing here is that overproduction of the protein is what causes the disease in this family, and the deposits, therefore, are a consequence of this overproduction. The presence of synuclein in Parkinson's disease, uh, Lewy bodies, was first shown, in fact, by Maria Spilantini. So this all fits together very well. I'm now going to just drop out of the... A slideshow for a second and show you, I hope. Hmm. Maybe not. Sorry, I seem to have pulled up a different version of the slide set than I had thought. But I was going to show you the pathology, the, the uh, clinical features of this woman. This, I'll just explain the clinical features. Although she has, she has Parkinson's disease, it's this, it was this woman here in the pedigree. She has Parkinson's disease with an age of onset of about 35. Um, her first symptom had been as she was queuing to catch a plane when she was in her mid 20s, she noticed a tremor, which is what she'd seen in her father. And it took her 50, the, the disease in her lasted 15 years before it finally killed her just at the age of over 40. I'll just say something about L-DOPA therapy for a second in this family. And that is that these individuals all died before L-DOPA therapy. And in these individuals, uh, the disease onset to death was something like seven years. On average, it was seven years before L-DOPA. But these individuals all had the benefit of L-DOPA therapy, uh, and they, uh, on average, survived fift over 15 years before they die of the disease. So it just shows you how, although L-DOPA is just thought of as a treatment therapy, as, a, as if you like, a, a therapy to deal with the symptoms rather than about dealing with the underlying pathogenesis, uh, still it, it allows the individuals to, to last 10 more years, and the first 10 of those years are very good years. So, you know, I think that we should, not, we should be really respectful, of course, of L-DOPA therapy. Now, Bob Nussbaum finding synuclein was the first gene. Here it is, synuclein. It's autosomal dominant, and the pathology is Lewy body pathology. The next gene that was found uh, was a recessive gene found by M Mitsuno in Japan, and that is, um, that is Parkin, the gene Parkin, which I'm going to talk about for a few seconds in a minute. The next gene after that that was found is pink one, also autosomal recessive, and that, has, uh, and that was found by my colleague at Queen Square, Nick Wood. The ne next gene after that was the gene DJ1, which was also found by an IPDGC member, Peter Herting, who was then 
in uh, Rotterdam, but is now in, uh, in Tübingen. And that is also autosomal recessive. And then this gene, FBOX07, I'll deal with at the same time. That's also a recessive gene. And that was found by Alahi, Alahi in Iran. The reason I've done those genes all together, they're all recessive and they all have in common that they are involved in mitophagy. They are all involved in the process of removing damaged mitochondria from, uh, from cells. And I'll show that in a second. The next gene that was found was uh, uh, LERC2. And that was found by uh, both Andy Singleton's group at the NIH and Tom Grasser's group in, in uh, Tübingen. And that is an important gene, not least because it's perhaps the most common cause of simple uh, uh, autosomal dominant disease. Uh, and that's been found in very high frequencies in European and Asian populations. There's a particular mutation in, in Europe, G2019S, uh, which is very, very common in actually Asia, in, in Europeans and people from North Africa. Uh, there are other mutations which are very common in the Chinese population. This is autosomal dominant and the onset age is in the 50s. Uh, it's interesting particularly because the pathology is usually Lewy bodies, not always about, uh, well, we have seven cases in the brain bank at Queen Square and six of them have Lewy bodies and the other does not. So it, the pathology is variable. The next gene, ATP13A2, was found in Jordan. And that is a, uh, in fact, is a lysosome, a lysosomal gene. And this was one of the first clue clues of the relationship between lysosomal disease uh, and, uh, and Parkinson's disease. Uh, and then PLAD2G6 was found by, as a gene for Parkinson's disease, was found by our group with Kailash Bhatia at Queen Square. We don't know exactly what that's involved, exactly what its function is, but we think it is also involved in lysosome in some way. And then there's VPS35, which is actually very similar, found by Matt Farah, very similar, in fact, to LERC2. A couple of other uh, genes involved in LERC2, with LERC2 and VPS35 have been found in the last couple of years, but they, and they have also similar features. So you can see that we have gone uh, in the last, uh, well, since 1996 from Sinuclean, we've gone through a really great period when we have found something like 15 autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive genes which cause Parkinson's disease. Now, you know, what we're trying to do, as I said at the beginning, is understand the pathways to disease. And I think the first stories which started to indicate that this was going to be possible were these papers here from Drosophila and this paper uh, from Mark Cookson for DJ1 in, uh, in, about, uh, in, in cell lines, uh, showing that these genes were all involved in mitophagy. And that is the process by which damaged mitochondria are now are removed from the cell. I, I should say that we geneticists sort of feel that we have discovered this. Uh, uh, you know, the, the genetics findings were in the late 1990s and early 2000s, but actually there's old papers uh, from, uh, for example, Tony Shapira amongst others, showing that there is, there has for many years been a, uh, an implication of something being wrong in mitochondria in the, uh, in the substantia nigra in Parkinson's disease. So in fact, this idea that mitochondria might be involved in Parkinson's disease is not a new idea. This is a, a, a slide 
which uh, Helen Plum Favreau, who worked on FBOX 07, uh, showed, shows that, uh, that summarizes the essence uh, of what we think is going on in, in Parkinson's disease. Here we have a mitochondria. Here on the cell membrane is the gene pink, and that's constitutively being cleaved. It's being cleaved, but when you get mitochondrial damage, the amount of it increases on the cell membrane, and that recruits FBOX07 to the mitochondria, and that leads to Parkin, for Parkin to ubiquitinate uh, mitofusin and target that mitochondria for removal. Now, this happens in all cells. Why is it important, particularly in the Nigra? We think, well, we don't, the, the true answer to that is we don't know, but we suspect it's because maybe dopamine metabolism is particularly destructive. Uh, it produces a lot of uh, free radicals, um, and it seems to be particularly perhaps destructive. So you get more mitochondrial damage in nigral, in nigral cells than other cells. And it's interesting, and one thing I did not emphasize, is the genes which are involved in mitophagy have a, a, diff, a, a subtly diff, well, a different clinical course to the others, and that is they remain rather nigral. In other words, people with these mutations, these recessive mutations, tend to have a very pure Parkinson phenotype, but they don't, uh, they don't often go on to develop, for example, dementia. Their, 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 their phenotype, although the disease starts quite early, they, uh, they, um, they don't develop other, uh, other symptoms. Now, I think a finding that really deserves some emphasis is the finding of glucocerebrosidase mutations in Parkinson's disease. And this originally came from clinical observations by Ellen Sidransky and others. Glucocerebrosidase mutations, as you know, uh, when homozygous, give rise to Gaucher's disease. And what these clinical researchers noticed was that often when they had kids with Gaucher's disease, the grandparents would often have Parkinson's disease. Uh, they'd have Parkinson's disease more often than you would expect by chance. Uh, and when that happened in a kindred, the affected grandparent always had the GBA mutation. And so this was the first clue that GBA heterozygosity um, predisposed to Parkinson's disease. I've mentioned ATP13A2, which is also a lysosomal gene uh, before. And so this is clearly a lysosome gene. And in fact, there's been a very nice paper from our colleague in the IPDGC, Josh Schulman, together with Peter Hertink. And they have shown that although we saw this, first of all, with GBA, we actually now think that mutations in many of the lysosome storage disease genes, which are usually, which are rarer than GBA mutations, or also predisposed to Parkinson's disease. So that gives the idea that um, uh, lysosome insufficiency, if you like, is a predisposing factor for Parkinson's disease. And that has led to this diagram being put together by my colleague, uh, Patrick Lewis, showing that um, putting this together and suggesting that many of the, the lysosome genes uh, are involved in the degradation of synuclein. And this is work that has been sh really shown in detail by the group from Northwestern University who've suggested that, there is, that synuclein is largely digested uh, through the lysosome and therefore fitting with the idea then that um, overproduction of, the, of synuclein is one cause of the disease, but failure to degrade it or insufficiency in degrading it uh, predisposes and is other causes of the disease. And that's led to this very simple diagram 
I've drawn this as mitophagy versus autophagy, but of course they're both very closely related biochemical pathways. Both of them uh, are involved in the, uh, in the lysosomal degradation of uh, either synuclein on the left or mitochondria on the right. And so as a general principle, maybe low level uh, lysosome insufficiency is part of the risk of developing the disease. Now that fit, that's where I'll stop really talking about the autosomal dominant and Mendelian forms of the disease. I'll now move to talk about understanding the disease more generally. The autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive diseases really explain quite a small proportion. It's different in different populations, but I would say in the English population, maybe somewhere between five and 10% of cases have got either a GBA mutation or one of these Mendelian causes of the disease. So that leaves a lot of cases of the disease with much of their genetic risk still to find. And with that background, firstly, Andy Singleton and Tom Gasser, and then uh, myself, Hugh Morris, Nick Wood, Peter Hertink, uh, and Alexis Brees all joined in to form the uh, International Parkinson's Disease Consortium. And what this consortium did was collected very, very large numbers of cases. As I'll show you now, it's in the tens of thousands of cases of Parkinson's disease and, and uh, ran genetic markers across the genome to see which genes were co-associated with disease. This is one of the early studies. I think at this stage we had about 3,000 cases and 3,000 controls. And, and what you can see here is the chromosomes along the bottom here and the significance value here. Because we're doing, we're running 500,000 markers and that means we have to um, test uh, we have to really do a massive Bonferroni correction because we're doing so many statistical tests. So we set the p-value at 10 to the minus 7 here, and what comes over the p-value is what we're allowed to declare. And the point I'll make from this is the first, the first three loci uh, which came out were synuclein again. Synuclein, of course, I've talked about already a large locus close to the tau gene, and then the HLA locus on chromosome six. So you can see then that this is starting to show um, uh, significant associations with these numbers of about 2000 cases. Incidentally, this peak here is LERC2. So LERC2 also comes out of this analysis. Now I'm gonna talk about synuclein for a second. I've mentioned that already that synuclein uh, triplications cause disease. And so what you have here is uh, uh, the expression of synuclein here. Whoops, sorry. Synuclein expression here and the risk of developing disease here. What I've talked about so far is the synuclein triplication. Here you're massively expressing the protein and you have an, well, you get the disease. It's autosomal dominant. There are families uh, which have duplications and they get the disease too. Their risk is high too, but they get it a bit uh, later, a bit, a, a bit, yes, a bit later. And now what I've shown you is that ordinary genetic variability in synuclein affects expression of disease. And what we now know is that ordinary variability alters the expression of disease, of synuclein. And those of us who have higher expression have a marginally increased risk of disease. And so there is a, a continuum, if you like, of understanding the, um, the, uh, the Mendelian forms of the disease 
and understanding the risk forms of the disease. And I mentioned that this was synuclein, and probably something similar is happening with synucleins. Ordinary genetic variability is contributing to the risk of disease by altering the expression. Now, the, the GWAS I showed you is a GWAS from about seven years ago. Now, this is the latest GWAS. Mike Knowles is the lead author uh, on this, and it's on Lancet Neurology. And you can see the peaks that were there before are still there, uh, uh, but the p-values are now enormous, way through the ceiling here. Synuclein is still the highest p-value. The tau locus is still here. I'm trying to see it, but it is still here. Yeah, it's here. And LERC2 is now easily significant. But what you can see is there are huge numbers. It's over 40, 50 now. There are huge numbers of other genes which are involved in disease. Now, because I'm going to come back to this point at the end, I'm just going to say something about these peaks. We know this peak is synuclein or something relating to synuclein. We know this peak is LERC2, or related to LERC2. And we label these others with gene names, but I have to say, in many cases, we, don't, we can't be absolutely precise about uh, the gene. Because what happens when you get these peaks is that if you could expand these peaks, you'd see that there were several genes involved uh, the, underneath the peak and it's very difficult in Caucasians to identify which of those genes underneath the peak is involved in disease and so what we do when we draw a diagram like this is we give our best guess but that best guess might not be accurate and I'm sure that some at least of these genes will be the peak is correct but the labeling of the gene is probably incorrect because the, what's called the linkage disequilibrium pattern in Europeans is much coarser than it is in Africans. I read that the, the whole population of Europe is probably derived mainly from around 10,000 individuals. So the story which we used to be told, I don't know if it's still believed to be true, is there's more genetic variability in one African village <coughs> than there is in all of Europe. And that means the genetic resolution in you, when you uh, work in African populations is much better than the genetic resolution in European populations. This though shows, I think, what we can achieve. This, this is uh, again put together by Mike Knowles, Mike Knowles and, Corn and Cornelis Blauendrat, showing how we have made progress in the number of genes we have found in Caucasians. Now well over 40 genes uh, have been found. So how can we... How, so I'm now going to deal with two things. How, how can we get better at identifying genes under peaks? And the answer to that is by studying the same process in African populations in particular. And of course, can we find other genes and other alleles and other risk factors in African populations so we can design treatments for those African populations based upon the genetic findings? To just illustrate this, we're now starting, uh, I say we in a general sense, starting to do treatments based on synuclein, experimental treatments. Obviously, uh, when you start to understand the genes involved in disease, you can start to devise perhaps strategies based upon those, based upon those genes. This shows you the, um, this shows you the, uh, the, the, the fact that the African populations are much more, much more interesting and fine-grained uh, than European populations. I like this map on the right. This shows how far are you from East Africa and how long 
is a haplotype. And the haplotype um, in, um, in, in, in Europe, well, this is actually, this is among American Indians, this is Europe here. The haplotypes in Europe are typically about 500 kilobases, whereas the haplotypes in Africa are of the order of 150 kilobases. So we get a three times better resolution. And that's shown here in a different way of plotting it. You get three times better resolution. So that means you can, uh, for each peak, you can dissect that peak on average about three times better in African population. So what can we do? What can we do about this? Well, the, what we need to do for both African populations and for the rest of the world is to, we need to find the underlying causes of genetic diseases, including of course, Parkinson's disease. We need to find those genetic causes in African populations. We need to find the Mendelian causes in African populations. We need to find the autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive populations. Um, actually, before I go further, I would say there's been a series of beautiful papers from North Africa identifying, uh, for example, Parkin and Pink One uh, families. So in, in North African populations, this work has started for many years but we need to find uh, these uh, types of mutations in sub-Saharan Africans. And we also need to find do GWAS in African populations to get better resolution. So this is to show you that uh, in particular, this is a particular uh, study of uh, a, a, a haplotype in, uh, in a, a Nigerian population in uh, an Af in, uh, here in the top, and here is a European population. And in this example, the a disease gene was, a disease locus was here, but the result in the GWAS was a series of hits like this, which didn't allow distinguish, distinguishing identification. But in African populations, you saw a clean hit only in the correct spot. And this has been used very successfully by another colleague of mine here at, at uh, UCL called Nick Magnatis to find new genes for type 2 diabetes in African population using cross-modeling, if you like, from hits we've known about in Caucasians and looking at those hits in a Nigerian population. So this is really a process which for other diseases has been successfully approached. Just want to say one thing which I think has always been of interest to me, and that is when I was at Mayo Clinic, we had a, an, a, a, a family uh, come to us from Jamaica, an African family come to us Jamaica, from Jamaica. And they had all been diagnosed as Parkinson's disease. And in fact, they all responded to L-DOPA. They got the disease in their late 40s. And they uh, were very dopam dopamine responsive, lasted for about 20 years on L-DOPA therapy. And uh, so we started to look for the gene in these families, in this, in this large uh, Jamaican family. And to our surprise, we found that the gene was actually SCAR3. And this, of course, is the gene for ataxia and not, uh, not the gene for Parkinson's disease, not a gene thought of as a gene for Parkinson's disease. And when we tried to write this uh, paper up, people just said it was because our clinicians were not very good at doing differential diagnoses and that they must be wrong, they must be ataxic. But in fact, we then uh, approached Subramanian Subramoni in Alabama, who has a, a large clinic in, of African Americans. And uh, we looked in, uh, he's a genetics, uh, clinical geneticist and neurologist in Alabama. 
and he collected uh, in sorry in Mississippi he had collected uh, several families for familial cases of Parkinsonism in his clinic and what we found is that many of those also ha had been diagnosed as Parkinson's disease but actually had SCAR3 mutations and what this is telling us is that different genes can have different phenotypes in different populations. I don't think that's very surprising, but I think it's very important for neurology in general, and I'm sure that it'll be the other way around too, that there will be um, cases which have mutations in one of the known Parkinson's disease gene, but will not be Park, have Parkinson's disease as far as a clinical exam is concerned. And so I think it's going to be very important to get good clinical records of all the cases that are collected in Africa so we can start to understand better in, in, in patient groups outside of Europeans what the clinical phenotype of different mutations is. So I think this is something that is very clinically exciting as well. So what do I see as the future directions? And I'm so pleased that the IPDGC Africa has set up. Well, we need to find families and find the genes which cause them. We need to find that for them, uh, so that down the line, they or the next generation in those families can get the state-of-the-art therapies based upon the genetic findings. We'll find a lot of the, a lot of the families we find will have genes we already know, um, uh, but we might find that they lead to different clinical phenotypes, and we might find that also that there are other genes uh, which lead to Parkinson's disease, which we expected to cause, for example, ataxia. The complex disease by GWAS, we need to see if there are African specific loci. Are we going to find new genes? And are they African specific? My expectation is that they won't be African specific, uh, but they, I, my expectation also is that we will find different variants in Africa and more variants in Africa than we have found in, Euro, in, in Europeans. And I think that this will eventually help us better diagnose the disease earlier in African populations. We're just now, a colleague uh, of mine, Alistair Noyce, is just beginning to use genetic information to try and make pre-symptomatic diagnosis of Parkinson's disease in European populations uh, so that they can be entered into clinical trials earlier. And of course, we hope that Down Levine will be able to do the same sorts of things in other populations as well and you know already a, a large number of especially Nigerian samples have been collected uh, by our collaborators there so we've really already set off on this road and I'm very excited about it so we'll almost certainly as we go down to this road together we'll almost certainly find new variants we might find completely new genes I think we would expect these to be in the mitophagy and autophagy pathways and I really hope that this will down the line help us to get better at diagnosing diseases earlier and recognizing the variability of the disease. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. Uh, actually, I've got some questions from our audience, but while people gather their thoughts and come up with uh, more questions, let me ask if you could uh, give us some sort of general uh, career advice, particularly for our uh, young audience. Well, I, uh, these, I have to say, I, it's, these days are worrying. These days are worrying. Of course, with COVID and so on, and the economy going down, these days are worrying. And that is something that I worry about in the UK as well. I mean, it's really worrying. But I think that, um, uh, I think, firstly, go into research if you like it.
go into research if you're passionate for it. If you enjoy it, that's the most important thing. When you're thinking, for example, of joining a lab, sit, ask other people in that lab, have they done okay? What jobs have they gone on to? How, did their mentor treat them well? And, uh, you know, that's uh, very, very, very important. Find out if you're joining a lab and you're going to work somewhere, have other people who've worked hard done well. I think that's a very important, uh, very important thing to do. Uh, so, you know, I would really say that's important. But the most important thing is to do it if, because you're interested in doing it. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. I, I just would like to remind our audience again to type their questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, so we can be able to answer them. So let me go ahead and try to read the first questions. Uh, what is the simple and best way to screen Parkinson's disease genes among the African population? As we know, most of the time, uh, we are limited in terms of funds and technical means. Mm. Yes, that's a difficult question and it depends exactly where you are. I, I understand the question and I, I, I mean, uh, now to do um, uh, a whole exome sequence, I mean, I would, act, well, what I would actually do is I would partner with, uh, uh, I think, unless your own institution is reasonably well off, I would partner with another institution uh, you know, uh, and but for example, but the prices are coming down. Exome sequencing now, so where you get where you could screen all the Mendelian disease genes is getting down to about three hundred dollars a sample. So if you think a a a, a family has a, a Mendelian mutation, then that's the sort of money you're looking for. But, you know, if you've got, at the moment, I think if you've got a family which is of interest, there is an IPDGC initiative. Um, well, it's a GP2 initiative, um, which is headed by Christine Klein um, for familial Parkinson's disease. And, they, and she is very interested in, uh, in, uh, in having families uh, a pedigree sent to her and she can do mutation screening, for, for example. So there are initiatives through the IPDGC. This is a GP2 initiative. So there are ways and means. But I'm happy to answer emails also about that. OK, so the next question is, have you done any genetic studies in uh, incidental Lewy body, Lewy body disease? We are doing, uh, well, we are doing genetic studies. In fact, there's a paper being submitted this week on dementia with Lewy bodies, uh, and nearly the same thing. So dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, has, and there have been papers from Jose Bra and Sonia Schultz, which are published on identifying loci for dementia with Lewy bodies. And they, those so far, have given a, a mixture of Alzheimer hits, APOE comes up, for example, and Parkinson's hits, so GVA comes up, for example. Uh, okay, so the next one is, what is the cause of death in those who died before LDOBA, LDOBA was discovered? Was BD disease progression or con committed medical complications such as aspiration pneumonia? Responsible it, aspira it was aspiration pneumonia. Okay. aspiration pneumonia so what is the implication of the genetics of the genetic diversity in african population on the incidence of bd on the continent we don't know that and that's something that it would be great to know it would be great to know what the incidence of disease is um you know that would be we don't really know that that you know um yeah we don't know okay uh it is very good and informative update. Someone is just saying, okay, quite far from, uh, since the same mutation could lead to a different clinical phenotype in, uh, in the African population, do you think this has something to do with the environment and epigenetic, epigenetic no, I think related it, modification? I think it's, I mean, I think it's to do more, I mean, that might have an influence, but I think it's more to do with the background genetics. You know, it, I think it's more to do with the genetic, the background genetics. So other genes modifying the phenotype. 
That's what I, that's my overall suspicion. Okay, I mean, it's, so. we, we, you know, I do, we do quite a few mouse experiments and there's some genes, uh, there's some of the Alzheimer mice that we make and they have different phenotypes in different strains of mice. You know, I think it's the same sorts of thing. You know, the background genetics has an influence. Uh, someone is asking, does the structure of alpha-synuclein alpha -synuclein play a role, play any role in the in BD or only the duplication or duplication of the gene is relevant? I don't know. If this is I think the deposition is always relevant. The deposition is always relevant. I think that, um, uh, you know, if you've got, if you're expressing huge amounts of it, you're going to get the disease. If you're expressing perhaps 10 or 15 percent higher than the general population if you've got other genetic risk factors then you might get the disease that's how i think of it uh, i'm trying to so uh, regarding sampling of the african population nigeria for example how difficult has has it been getting that data from nigeria how did you try uh, to overcome this challenge? Well, it wasn't me who, who overcame the challenge, let me just say. It was Nijitika Okubud. I'm, I'm sorry, Nijitika Okubadejo in Nigeria. She, so she overcame the challenge. She overcame the challenge. So she, she is the one who overcame the challenge. She can tell you how she did it. So someone okay in a recent GWAS in the Asian population they found 11 loci two novel and nine replications from loci already found in European would you consider the population a specific loci associated with BD relevant to BD by pathogenesis yes yes you know yes I would I, I would so for just to give you one example the tau locus only comes up in Europeans. And, uh, and the reason for that is that the tau locus has a very, is very variable in Europeans for complicated reasons. It is not variable in the same way in other populations. So whatever the gene is at the tau locus, I think it will be involved in all races but it's only variable in Europeans. And so you only see it as a genetic risk in Europeans. So I think that the same proteins are gonna be involved in pathogenesis in all cases. It's just that genetics gives you different types of information in different populations. Uh, actually, we have got a lot of questions. So um, I will try to pick the most relevant one and then maybe we'll answer the the other questions later through emails. So would you suggest collecting a taxi and other families with movement, movement disorders in Africa to screen for different genes? Would we send this to your lab at UCL? I would, I would suggest collecting them. I would suggest collecting them. In fact, a taxi is, is worked on particularly by my colleague, Henry Holden, and you're welcome to email me He's also involved in the in these collections of Parkinson's cases, but he he is a major force in the ataxia genetics. I would be very happy to receive emails if I am not interested. Well, not interested, but if I am not working, could not work on them, I would forward it to a colleague who who would be. Okay, this is like long question. I will try to read it quickly. So you talk about impaired protein degradation and genetic mutations that cause this impairment concerning autophagy dysfunction. What about the impairment, uh, what is, what about the impairment of the ubiquitin proteasome system from genetic point of view and risk of PD? Uh, I don't, yeah, no, that's a very good question. And it's something I've thought about quite a bit. I don't think it is particularly involved in PD, but actually, some of the ALS, some of the FTD, frontotemporal dementia genes, uh, are, are involved are ubiquitin proteasome genes. So I do think that mutations in the ubiquitin proteasome system 
are important, but more in, in, uh, in frontotemporal dementia ALS. Okay, so another question. What about the faulty protein degradative clearance of, of excess alpha synuclein production in BD? Someone is asking. I don't know say, if you get his question. No, say that again. What about the faulty protein degradation? His, he or she is asking about the faulty protein degradation clearance of excessive alpha synuclein production in BD. So that is, um, the, the, I'm blocking on the name of the person who's worked on this. There's a series of very, very good papers from Northwestern University showing that a lot of synuclein is degraded through the lysosome. I'm blocking on the name of the individual, I, I, it's, but it's Northwestern University and oh, Dimitri Crank. Dimitri Crank in, uh, in, uh, in Northwestern University has produced very good papers on this topic. Okay, thanks for the great talk. In fact, we have started a Sudanese neurogenetic group in Sudan. We started to get more phenotypic and genetic uh, particularities in our cohort. Uh, particularly the study, uh, okay, so in our cohort, they study in HSP, epilepsy and leukodystrophy as well. So, yeah, she just trying to say that they already started a new That's great, and group. if they want yeah. any help, listening to that list of diseases, if they wanted any help, they could email me and I would email that to Henry Holden, because he, that's exactly, that's exactly what his group is, um, is uh, finding genes for and so on. So if they want help, they should email me and I'll, well, they can email Henry Holden directly, but otherwise they can email through me. Yeah, so someone is asking about the genetics of sporadic Parkinson disease. Have the genetics underpinning being studied, are they similar to the inherited types? Very much so. So lurk 2 mutations, for example, they look just like typical PD. They look just like typical PD. Okay, someone is saying, is it still okay to call BD idiopathic Parkinsonism? No, I don't think so. But, you know, I don't want to change the name. <laughs> it, it, you know, it, you know, I guess it isn't okay. I guess it's, I guess, you know, if you know the cause, you don't need to call it idiopathic anymore. I'd never thought of it before, but you're right. That is, that is, it is time we change the name. So someone is asking, how often do patients with BD present with metabolic disorders? Oh, I, I'm not the right person. I'm not the person to ask that. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, so do you think gene therapy would be feasible for Parkinson's as there are so many variants of the disease within a population itself? If not, what would be, what do you, what would you suggest? Well, I think that down the line, it will be possible. I mean, Already people are starting to do uh, antisense therapy for synuclein and um, therapies based upon boosting glucocerebrosidase in Parkinson's disease. So these are types of gene therapies. This is starting. It, it, none is in clinic yet, but it's starting. Okay. How has this genetic finding altered or changed a favorable therapeutic model for Parkinson's disease patient? I I th well, it. it's not changed it much yet, but I think it will. It'll take some time uh, to do that, but it will change it for sure. Yeah, I mean, what like... has happened is that some, for example, some of the LERC2 mutation carriers are starting to go into clinical trials before they develop clinical, before they develop symptoms. So that is altering. That's, a, that's really progress in a way. Uh, it seems like we are running out of time, actually. It is almost 5 o'clock right now. So we will try to get back to the, uh, to the other questions. But would you like to provide some sort of closing remarks before we close today? Yes. Thank, well, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks to me also, who I think is on, uh, for organizing this. Uh, I, you know, I really encourage people, if people email me, I will 
if I don't answer, if I can't answer the question, any questions myself, I'll forward it to somebody who can, and I'll do my best to be helpful. I think that it, it is exciting. I'm so pleased that we've started the collection. Well, actually, we started the collection in Nigeria in the 1990s, and now we've restarted it. So it's really an exciting time. Uh, I, I think that we can make great progress. And the Fox Foundation has been very generous in helping set this up. So really, I think we can do a great job with the um, with uh, African clinicians and research group to get this going. Yeah, actually, we've got more than 48 questions, and it is really difficult to answer all of them in the 15 minutes that we can have. So, a, can you yeah. do a, a select all? and um, copy it and then send it to me as an email. Yeah, okay, so we will do so. So, and we will also send this uh, recording, actually the recording of the webinar to our audience in their emails. So with that, I would like to thank you for this wonderful talk and also thank May uh, Rizik and Aisha for putting all this together actually. And also thank our audience for tuning in and for their interaction and questions and have a wonderful rest of your day and bye for now. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank, Thank you. you so